here at this stage my sketch, which is on my usual paper of choice, which is Canson Moulin de Roy uh, pencil sketch, fairly light, lightly sketched in, and I have my base texture in the background here. I did some faux gold leaf, which is essentially copper, and I embedded it inside layers of Daniel Smith clear watercolor ground first, and then later a little bit of the white, titanium white watercolor ground just to help it blend into the paper areas better. So that's what I've got to start with right now. And now I'm going to begin with the painting part. I have here a flat brush, it's like a what, half inch brush, and I'm just going to start wetting down the background areas because I am going to be doing washes and I am sort of avoiding the dragon not being super careful about it because this is not going to be a very dark wash. This is going to be just my initial sort of um, highlight layers of wash, I guess. It's, it's what everything else is going to fade into. So it doesn't have to be super careful, but in general, sort of avoiding the dragon and the foxes down there but lots of water in the upper areas because I'm going to want to wa want to have darker and more fluid washing up there. All right, so now that, and I'm going to take some buff titanium from my palette here, and maybe a little bit of the nickel yellow here, mixing those. And just doing wet and wet right here into my wet down background. Particularly around the dragon is where I want to get these lighter colors. Because I want to him in the end to have a sort of glow aspect. And so I'm going to be working in the other background elements into this yellow. So this buff titanium yellow area. Okay, and now, now I'm going to get some undersea green, which I'm going to squeeze directly from the tube because the granulation works better when you do it with the fresh paint. I mean, it works still with the dry, but sometimes when I'm doing larger background areas, and this isn't even particularly large, uh, I do like to have more concentrated form of the pigment. And I happen to have my undersea green out right now Sometimes if it's tucked away inside all my my stash of watercolor paints, I don't want to dig it out, hunt through the, all the colors that I have in order to find it, and so then I'll just use it for my palette. Okay, so working that in, wet and wet still. Made sure to do this all quickly, if you'll notice. I made uh, certain that the background area was still wet when I started applying this because that lets things nicely bleed and blend together. You see already it's sort of flowing into the other initial colors that I laid in. And you'll also note that I am keeping my colors away from the dragon. I'm keeping it to the upper portion and letting, letting anything that comes close happen naturally just because of bleed. So it's just naturally being pulled down by the liquid into those portions of the painting rather than me specifically coming up against the edges of dragon and foxes and stuff. On this lower area, let's see, do I still want to use this? I think I might use some shadow violet. You know what? I lost my color chart for about six months now. And so for six months, I couldn't remember the names of everything that I have in my palette here. I know what they all look like. I mean, I, I can just go in here and pick a color and I know what I'm using, but I couldn't remember the exact color. So whenever I was talking about it, I was like, oh, this purpley color. <laughs> so if you notice that I wasn't being exact about my color names for the past six months, that was the reason why. 
And it turns out all this time, I, and I knew this thing was somewhere. It just was tucked. It had fallen behind my desk. It had slipped down behind where my drawers are, so I couldn't even see it when I searched under my desk. So I felt very happy when I came across it yesterday. And I came across it simply because I think something else slid behind there at that moment. And I saw the thing slide and I was like, oh, I need to get it. Oh yeah, it was a bottle, a little bottle of glue. And I saw this bottle of glue slide over. And so I reached over to grab the glue and lo and behold, I found all this other stuff that had fallen there as well, including my color chart. So yay. <laughs> I'm adding some of the Shadow Violet to this upper portion as well. Shadow Violet is another one of those gorgeously granulating colors that Daniel Smith has. So it's a good one for if you want textury goodness happening in your painting. And I'm just dotting in bits of it, wet and wet, letting it do its spreading thing. Now the key with granulating pigments is that you don't want to touch them too much. You want to just drop them into your painting and then leave them there. And the granulation happens because the particles of the pigment slowly clump together as the water evaporates. And so what you get left with are these little clusters and clumpy bits of texture that look so beautiful and so organic. And you don't get that if you keep messing around with the paint. Now I'm gonna also bring some of this buff titanium yellow stuff, which has now also been mixed with a little bit of my other colors because I'm not super careful about keeping it all separate, but that's okay because I actually want stuff to blend and mix and intermingle. In fact, this slower part, I am going to go with some French ultramarine. I just discovered something about French ultramarine the other day. I mean, I knew that ultramarine is based on lapis lazuli and that that was highly prized way back, but I didn't realize that French ultramarine is actually a synthetic version of that lapis lazuli paint. And it is, uh, it's a more intense, actually. It's a more brilliant blue than the natural lapis. That's interesting because I, I always, actually, I don't know how often pigments now are made with the actual lapis when you buy them. Um, even though they're called just regular ultramarine, you'll see them like that in stores. Um, but it probably, for the most part, is, is French ultramarine, even though when it says that. Something, someone might correct me if I'm wrong about that. Right, I'm just dotting some water into here because water also helps with the cool granulating effects. Just dropping splashes of it into areas. All right, so here we go. Here we have this wet and wet stuff now. And I'm just going to let that sit and dry. As I said, the key to having cool granulating textures is to not fiddle with it too much. So you can't touch it once you let, once you have everything in here and with the water, you just let it go and you just sit back. It takes maybe, with the amount of water I have on here, maybe half an hour. So you can work on some other painting, go watch some TV, drink some tea, have some yummy stuff to eat, whatever. A few things I'm going to do right now. First, I'm going to take a one of my synthetic brushes, just get some water on it, and scrub around the area where this pearl is because I want to lift some of the pigment so that it's not such a hard... <gasps> Ooh, spilled my water. <laughs> so that it's not such a hard edge around it. And then dab with paper towel, repeat. This takes, this is, this is called lifting. It's where you're, you're taking some of the pigment off the page after having applied it. It's a little bit like erasing watercolors, but it's not so 
uh, complete as racing. At least, it depends on what pigment you use. Some pigments lift extremely easily and some do not. This is kind of middle of the road lifting. It's not terribly hard. All right, there, so you see, I pulled out some of the paint around there. So before the edge around this pearl was this hard edge like that. And now after lifting, it's very soft diffuse look. And I'm gonna do the same thing over here because I, I don't want so much of it into the dragon. So this is why before I told you I wasn't super careful about where my wash was spreading because I'm more interested in having a really beautiful background textured wash than I am in keeping every little bit of color out of my main focal points because these colors that I'm using initially are, as I said, very fairly light. So it's not gonna be a huge problem even if there is some of it that spreads into the dragon and into the pearl area. In fact, having a little bit of that color in here that I'm lifting out now and leaving this, this ghost residue of that color helps to tie everything in from the background into the foreground. It helps blend and unify your painting because you have these external colors now intruding into your foreground and that makes it, uh, that gives your edges that little bit of sort of reflected color from the surroundings and unifies everything. So it can be actually a good thing to have some of this bleed happening. Now, all right, you see up here, this is, this is all the granulating that I talked about earlier. I love that. But I actually want to get some, a little bit of darker bits with my Indian ink thing that I do. So to retain and make sure that what I've got here already doesn't just blend and blur away, what I do is I take my clear watercolor ground once again, and I dilute it a little bit. I have, actually, I just do it in the lid. I'm not super, uh, yeah, I don't get out a special thing for this. I just dilute a little bit of it into the lid and brush it over these upper areas. And you wanna move your brush quickly you don't want to spend too much time. You don't want to linger and really press into your page because if you do so, you're going to end up shifting the, the pigment and the, the textures are going to get lost. But if you just do this really quickly, move your brush fast and lightly across the page, you can get a layer, a thin layer of this watercolor ground over the top of everything, and that in effect will fix the textures down so that you don't have to worry about them shifting when you add more liquid and other layers on top. And I'm not doing it onto the rest of the painting. I'm keeping it just in this upper portion because that's where I'm going to be focusing my Indian ink texturing stuff. And I'm definitely not getting it into the area around the pearl because I might want to lift around there again later. So I'm leaving, leaving it clear of here. Mainly it's this upper portion and sort of just blending a little bit down. Again, gotta let this dry. We'll come back to it in a second. This is Winsor and Newton Indian ink. You can't really see it because I've spilled ink on it, but the label used to have a dragon right here. Uh, you can see it in some of my other videos, though, if you want to know exactly what I'm using here, because I do this all the time on my paintings. But, again, I'm going to wet down... Oh, by the way, this is all dry, because that was the, the stuff that I did with the transparent watercolor ground. It doesn't take very long to dry. This took maybe 10 minutes. So, getting everything wet once again. Lots of wash layers that I do in the initial phases of my paintings. Okay, this time I'm getting a good amount of water on it. You can see the sheen 
of the liquid because I'm going to need a lot of liquid for the Indian ink to flow in. And I'm going to take some of this stuff and just drop it in. I don't really need a ton of it. I just need a few drops because they will go far. I'm going to move my water over to the other side so you don't have to see my arm going back and forth across all the time. But I'm going to add even more water than what I started off with and start tilting my surface to let it move. I'm going to add a little bit more of the Indian ink. Just dotting it in. You don't want too much because then it just turns... Well, actually, there isn't really too much. I, I have added a ton before and you get some really thick, gorgeous granulating going then. But for this piece, I don't need, a, I don't need a, that much. I just need a little bit more darkness in this texture up above. So that's what I'm trying to accomplish with this India ink thing. So once I get stuff flowing and moving, then once again, just as I did with the initial first layer of wet and wet wash with the watercolor, I got to let this dry. So this is, uh, this is going to take probably about another hour to do. So this phase can take a while because there's a lot of waiting in between for layers to dry. So frequently I might start another painting at this point and, and just have a couple things going on the burner at one time so that I don't have to sit around with my arms folded waiting. <laughs> but yeah, I'm gonna wait for this to dry once more. So I decided that since all the wet stuff is basically here and up, I can actually do quite a bit of work right now on this lower part of the painting because there's nothing stopping me from doing that. That's all nicely dry. And so this is where we are going to focus our attention right now. Let's see, the only problem is positioning my paint somewhere where you can see it that doesn't interfere with the wet stuff. Oh. All right, I am going to start with a glaze of some imperial purple. Down at the bottom corner here, it takes off the cooler blue edge a little bit. I do want to retain that side of the color wheel, that purpley blue tones in this area, but I don't want it to be quite so blue because right now I've got green and yellow and red and with the blue it just turns the whole thing into a big old rainbow. I'm not too fond of full out rainbows in my color schemes. So I want to take off the the bluish edge, muting it a little bit by taking some of the brownish bits of stuff I've got here in the palette. I love making use of this the random color mixes that happen in my palette for neutral tones and things. Okay, so now I have that. Just lightly brushing a glaze over everything. Blending it all. And another thing I'm noticing right now all right, so I can't lift it and move too much because if I do, it's going to cause the Indian ink to start moving and flowing again. But if you can see the edge of my water wash up above has this very hard edge drying line here, which you can't see yet in terms of color tone. But the thing is that if I leave that liquid edge to dry, you will see a hard um, sort of waterline mark along the edge of things. So what I want to do is I'm going to take a paper napkin and I'm just sort of dabbing to blend 
the dampness level, I guess, of the page in those areas so that it goes from being really, really wet to sort of wet to completely dry rather than like wet, 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 dry. And I'm doing that along this line too. I don't want to get too into the wet stuff because I've got some bit of Indian ink in there doing its thing and I don't want to disturb that. But I do just want to get rid of this hard water line. Meanwhile, my foxies here have been sort of drying out a little bit more. I'm gonna start doing a, let's see, what color should I take? I think actually I'm going to take that undersea green that I've got in my palette here. It looks like it's been mixed with some golds and stuff, but essentially it's undersea green there. And this is still a little damp, that's okay. I am taking a small fine brush now, and wet and wet, just, shaping the ground spirally textures that I've got. This sort of uh, ground spiral stuff signature in my pieces frequently you see. I do ground textury things like this. Now you see because it's wet and wet it does bleed outward. I'm going to zoom in on that a little bit so that you get a better view of what's going on. You see the page is damp and so as soon as I touch my brush with pigment to it, it spreads out the pigment a little bit. It lets it sort of poof and bloom out. And that's good because it's nice to have the surrounding elements to your focal points. So focal point in this being the dragon and the foxes. Um, letting those be the sharpest and most in focus, hence focal point. <laughs> While the rest of your stuff is nice to have it a little bit blurred, um, a little bit mute muted in its tones, having some kind of contrast. I've talked about this before in, in some of my walkthroughs and uh, insights that I post on my Patreon page, but you want to have in your piece some kind of contrast in your background and foreground elements, whether that contrast is in the, the uh, colors that you choose. If you have opposing colors between the foreground and background, that's one way of doing it, or, or in the focus of the elements. So if you have the foregrounds very, very clear and crisp and in focus, while your background elements are fuzzy and more blurred. Uh, and the, the final is just the intensity uh, or the brightness even. Um, you can have some, the foreground being very bright and the background being very dark so that create this silhouette type of action or the opposite where the foreground is dark and the background is light. So, there are these three ways of creating contrast in your piece and really making your foreground then pop out and clear to the viewer as the focus, as the thing that they should put their attention to initially when they come to your painting. Now you can also combine any of these concepts. You can also use multiples of them in the same piece so that you really bring out that focal point. You can have the blurring and the color contrast or the, the light and the blurring. You know, any of these, any combination of these works well or any single one of them, but you need at least one of them to really keep your piece from being just a complete a distraction of elements. If there's just too much going on, your viewer just doesn't know where to look and they don't know where to start. And that can be a problem for your composition then.